I want to introduce my brother from another mother, Anthony Clark. Um, on Twitter, Anthony Clark describes himself as, quote, a teacher helping to fight to end capitalistic oppression. Yes. Couldn't be a better segue if I tried. Uh, uh, Anthony Clark is a high school teacher in Illinois, a former member of the military, a veteran campaigner in Illinois politics, and he's currently running for village trustee of Oak Park. Um, uh, Anthony, first and foremost, man, it's good to see you. How are you, brother? Man, I'm over here. Y'all testifying. Y'all was just preaching, you know, so I'm feeling it, man. I'm thinking about all my overdraft fees, but I'm good. And, you know, hey, man, I know you said something prolific. I know you said something dope. <laughs> I know whatever you said was amazing. I didn't hear it, but I know the audience heard it. <laughs> so, man, that's it. Man, I was y'all, it was me too. <laughs> y'all over here. For me. But, uh, such a pleasure to be on. You know, thank you all so much, you know, for all that y'all do. And I'm um, looking forward to chopping it up a little bit. Yeah, man. So we we just kind of stumbled into this conversation um, and, and it's right in your purview, right? I see you discussing it on Twitter all, all the time. The realities of this capitalistic oppression, the realities of the fact that this is not, we're not outliers, right? The people who are struggling right. with overdraft fees, the people who are struggling to pay their rent, the people who are having to go out and be uh, essential workers in the middle of a pandemic when the government really could have shut this down and put money in our hands, but they don't want to because they consider that socialism. This is what you talk about all the time. What are your thoughts on, just, let's, start on the, let's start all the way at the 30,000 foot level, man. What are your thoughts on that type of oppression in this country? Uh, no question. No question. You know, I feel like the ultimate struggle is class struggle. You know, we all have our identities. We all have our collective identities, which are extremely important. But, you know, in my opinion, if we look at throughout history, uh, racism, sexism, so on and so forth, they are tools utilized to maintain and justify capitalistic oppression. So when we fast forward to 2021, the issues that you are all talking about, it's by design, because if we think about the stigmas and the perceptions that are attached to struggle, that are attached to being broke, uh, it keeps individuals from being honest. It often keeps individuals, like you were saying, to be on social media, trying to front for the gram, you know, trying to cap, uh, as my students like to say, and, and present a lifestyle that one, they cannot afford, two, is leading them to be further in debt, and three, is not realistic, you know, so for someone like myself, I'm extremely honest and transparent, and you know, I don't know how much time we have, but I filed bankruptcy. You know, I filed for Take bankruptcy. Time. Completely. <laughs> completely open and transparent about that. Because again, think about the stigma that are, is attached to debt, right? Think about the stigma that is attached to individuals filing for bankruptcy and how hard it is. And even our current president roles that he's played in the past, you know, yes. preventing student debt uh, from being addressed and eliminated yeah. through bankruptcy law. Uh, so I, I love to tell that truth that it was the best decision I made because I think one thing that isn't discussed often as a teacher, you know, I started out making after the military, making about what, $16,000 a year after taxes. Now, you know, I'm, I'm finally in a teaching position to where I'm making six figures. Though I'm not an athlete, I think we need to talk more about how individuals in certain families, the family nucleus, when you make it or are perceived to make it, it's almost like being an athlete or entertainer to where now mm. you all you have all this pressure. You know, I'm not a millionaire, but with a six figure salary, mm -hmm. I now have three or four family members that I'm helping out. I have five or six friends that are routinely and constantly reaching out to me for loans and so on and so forth. And then my, I myself I'm trying to cap, right? You know, I got to have the nice car, the nice clothes, the jewelry. I'm stunning. The, I'm stunning in the clubs. I'm at grocery stores pretending to call the bank when my car declines, you know, having that conversation. Like, hold on, hold on. I know it's there. So we go through this. Uh, but the best decision I had was fighting against that stigma, fighting against those perceptions that exist and being open about my financial journey, uh, you know, addressing financial literacy or lack thereof and, and, yeah. and moving forward. And we got to yeah. talk about it. We can't be embarrassed to talk about these issues, you know? No, no. And I, I appreciate you framing it exactly the way you did, man, because there's a, the stigma attached to our oppression, right? And we got to think about where that stigma comes from. That stigma don't, I mean, sometimes it is perpetuated by people in the same class structure, right? We, we, we do have a tendency to be like, oh, you struggling? And then we struggling ourselves. Like, oh, right. you ain't got this? And we got it at, from rent center You know what I mean? We, we do have a way of capping <laughs> right. and, and stuttering, you know what I mean? But right. the, the, over, oh, the overwhelming preponderance of this stigma comes from the, the glamorous life that is 
imposed on us through television, entertainment, internet, mm -hmm. social media, Instagram, right? And then people aspire to that. And as they aspire to that, they either become depressed because they have no absolutely no chance of getting that life, or they spend all their good coins trying to get to that life. Meanwhile, we can't even get this government to pass a $15 minimum wage. We're stuck at nope. $7.25. And you tweeted about this the other day. You said, uh, you said, please, someone name a job that you believe is only worth $7.25 an hour. And in and, and the visual representation, I, I mean, people like think about a $5 bill, $2 bills, and a quarter. That's what this system is telling us, Anthony, is, uh, is the value of people's labor for an entire hour. Speak on that for me. I mean, no, I mean, it's a huge issue that exists at the federal level. And like you stated, you know, I, I also I was thinking about that pot line. You know, we got money for wars, but we don't have money to feed the poor. You know, we're, we're yeah. meanwhile, we're begging for a $15 federal minimum wage when we know in reality, $15 is not even enough. You know, we truly mm -hmm. need a, a livable wage. 15 isn't enough, but we can't even get that. But meanwhile, we're bombing Syria. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. we're still in a forever war. Meanwhile, we can't get a stimulus check that was supposed to be 2000, but the math is funny. So now we're at 1400, <laughs> but still don't have it. So, I right. mean, we could go down this, this, this rabbit hole and continue, but again, it's by design because it's about profit margins at the end of the day. And no matter if your title is a Democrat or Republican, they're invested in profit margins. They're invested in mm. providing socialism to corporations while individuals, again, are chastised and judged uh, for wanting greater help from the government. And I'll end it here. What's so treacherous about it is if we think about the civil rights movement and before uh, desegregation, when we had thriving black communities, rich socioeconomic communities like Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, mm. so on and so forth, they were destroyed. They were literally yeah. bombed. Right. People were literally killed because we weren't reliant on that white dollar. They want us to be passive. We could go back to chattel slavery and the enslavement of Africans. They want us to, to, to stay prayed up, drunk and broke. So that's why when you go into the hood, mm. what do you see? You see churches, liquor stores and, and, mm. and you know, these, these long places. They want to keep you in debt because it's a new form of or a continued form of enslavement. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to bring my colleague Rebecca Zor into the conversation. But before I do, I want to follow one last question with you as you were talking about your background in serving in the military, understanding the role of the military in this country and the global imperialism. But from your perspective, you tweeted out that, that you entered into a poverty draft, serving six years of active duty to survive. Talk about that specifically in terms of how the military is is oftentimes a way out for poor people, but it's also exactly targeting poor people. Definitely, definitely. I mean, it's a huge issue that exists. I was struggling. You know, I moved to Atlanta after high school and I just found myself in a financial bind and lost. You know, I was looking for housing. I was looking for employment. I was looking for food. And I was at the point where I couldn't rely on my parents because even though they loved me and sacrificed everything, they were struggling themselves. So when we look at military recruitment, because we, of course, no longer have the draft, where do military individuals usually recruit? Where are recruiting stations and ROTCs usually set up? In the hood, in urban communities communities with lack of investment in their public school systems because we know how property taxes are inequitable and lead to further oppression. But that's what it is. It's a poverty draft because the military dangles in front of you. If you join and you fight this rich person's war, we will provide you with housing. We will provide you with uh, food. And we will provide mm -hmm. you with employment. And you could pay for your education in the future with the GI Bill. So that's what right. was dangled in front of me. And when I entered into the military, one, I found and learned how struggle is universal, because when we went to other countries mm -hmm. and other territories, so on and so forth, you saw poverty. Struggle is a universal yeah. language. I may not have been able to understand them verbally, but I understood their poverty. I understood their Come struggle. On, but yet we use you know, codes and we use titles to present them as enemies when they're simply trying to survive as well. These are not insurgents. Mm -hmm. These are not my enemies. These are individuals living within the struggle as well, doing what they need to do. And they look at us just as we look at them. You know, one person's mm -hmm. terrorist is another person's patriot. So the military was a huge wake up call for me. I mean, the mount and I ended here. But, you know, I was a, a, a airplane mechanic. And the fact that we have to perpetually train, you know, for war and one tire 
one tire costs like $450. And we were going on one plane, we were probably going through three to four tires per day. So we know where that money is going. We know why it's upmarked and so on and so forth. I mean, it's a hustle. It, it really yeah. is. And, and we're hustling on the backs of the people of this country. And, and the money that we spend on this military industrial complex could truly go to education, could truly go to infrastructure, could truly go to housing and food and security. Uh, but yet it does not. Mm, mm, mm. Look, cause that was a lie. I was just like, wow. It's just, <laughs> Break it pause. It's just been, no, the, a lot of what you said from the, from the beginning of the conversation to now, it's, um, it's a, a teachable moment. A lot of things yeah. you, you dropping are a gym. So what I asked to you is your position as an educator, right? And mm-hmm. you get to, you, you discuss these things. How is it that you're able to, cause, um, it seems to other people that this may be radical, but mm, I right. know that you say you still teach your students this. So how are you able to have these conversations, be clear about it and yeah. not get any pushback? Not to say that you don't. Right. Um, no, 100%. And I, and I feel like you all live this truth as well. And I think that when you are black, you know, because there are people of color, they're black individuals. I like to separate it because, you know, they try to, I think, marginalize us and push us into just people of color. But when you are black and vocal, and I feel like there's always pushback. I mean, literally, I'm in my superintendent's office maybe once or twice a month based upon parents calling the school, trying to report me for various things that I'm doing in the community or various things that I'm sharing because they want you to be docile, right? They just want you to be quiet. Just, just be happy to be here. You in a predominantly white space, you're making decent (laughs) money. You should just be happy to be here. We're allowing you to be here. But when you push back at that, of course it creates issues. Uh, So in my 12 year teaching career, I've been suspended twice uh, with pay, thankfully, due to, you know, union support. But I've been suspended for a total of six months in my teaching career based upon the last time I was suspended. They stated that I was radicalizing students and teaching mm. students how to protest. So there's mm. always pushback, you know, but there's a saying that I have that when you rock the boat, you better be well, ready to swim and able to swim. Mm. And, you know, I have to make that decision that I'm not going to be promoted. I'm never going to be a school administrator. Uh, I'm never going to be the one in leadership positions within a building, if that makes Makes sense due to my uh, willingness to engage and push the envelope uh, to further radicalize our students and get them to question everything, even what I share with them. I never position myself as I always make I statements. So I never position myself to my students as this is truth. These are my beliefs. I want you to research them for yourself and come back to me and tell me if you were able to debunk anything. And if you were mm-hmm. not, what do you feel about what I share with you and make your own decisions? So there's always going to be pushback. But it's worth it at the end of the day, because what are we here for? You know, individual individual progress. I'm not interested in that. If we don't have collective movement and collective growth, what is the purpose? And I think we had that prior to desegregation. And that could be a topic for a whole nother, I'm sure, show. But once we desegregated, it seems like we lost that purpose in a sense. We lost Mm. that collective sense of pride to where we were moving forward as a black community to strive for excellence. And now we're basically attaining and trying to aspire to what the white definition of success is, what the white definition of power and influence is. And of Mm. course, that's that false, that false narrative of individualism uh, within a capitalistic society to where collectively the legacy of enslavement still benefits white folk and still impacts us negatively. (laughs) See, see, they done messed around. They done messed around and let a whole bunch of us get connected because we all, man, you spitting some truth right there. Speaking of truth, you sitting in front of an image of one of the most powerful, prolific truth tellers in the history of this uh, country, Chairman Fred Hampton. Tell us about that image behind you and your connection in terms of 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 just the the spiritual, the 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 influence of chairman on your life. No, definitely. Uh, I mean, I idolize, you know, Chairman Fred, you know, he was 21 when he was murdered, you know, by the Chicago police and by our local government. 21 years of age, and he was so far ahead of his time. And one thing that I realized, and again, you know, this may be a little bit controversial, but I truly feel like those that were tapped into and truly addressing class issues, they're no longer here. Mm -hmm. They either had Mm -hmm. to leave the country or were murdered or were incarcerated. So Mm. that's why, again, I'm I'm just going to say it. That's why MLK is gone. But we yes, still sir. have an Al Sharpton or Jesse Jackson. I'm just keeping Ooh. it 100. You know, that's why mm. Chairman Fred Hampton was here. murdered. <laughs> but we still have, you know, a Bobby Rush or someone else that's still here, still alive. Because when you're truly tapped into class warfare and class issues, you got to go. Because one mm. thing that 
Fred Chairman Fred Hampton was doing was with the uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Rainbow Coalition. He yeah. was uniting poor blacks with poor whites, with poor Puerto Ricans. You yeah. can't marginalize a movement like that when you get a, a, a unified intersectional, uh, uh, you know, movement attacking class issues. So that's why I mm. idolize him. You know, I'm, I'm close with his family. Uh, you know, his childhood home in Maywood, Illinois, which is not far from where I live. We help fundraise for it. Uh, I know yeah. his son, Chairman Fred Jr., who's, you know, head of the Black Panther Party Cubs. Uh, his brother, late brother Bill uh, Hampton, God rest his soul, you know, provided me with an award. Even though I don't believe in individualism, it was still an honor to receive that award from him. Uh, so we're, we're tied in and we're close. You know, they're turning the, the home into a, a museum. Uh, but yeah. we have to learn from Chairman Fred. And many of the issues are all of them that the Black Panther Party pushed. When we're talking about the food program, you know, feeding children, feeding those that are in need, when we're talking about protection in our community, when we're talking about health care, these are issues that the Black Panther Party basically revolutionized and fought for. And for that, they were labeled communists. For that, they were labeled mm. terrorists. Meanwhile, we see what true terrorism looks like when we have predominantly white folks storming the Capitol uh, in That's the name it. of Donald Trump, not even policy. Mm but in the name of Come Donald on. Trump, who represents white supremacy. So we have to talk about these issues. And, you know, Chairman Fred, again, I'm going to follow in his footsteps. And, and you know, I'm never I'm probably never going to get to the point where somebody wants to assassinate me or murder me. But as long as I could teach, okay. you know, teach a little bit about his legacy and play a collaborative role in pushing for real change and educating our community, I'm happy. Yeah. But, you know. You know they got a, a, a file on you, right? Though you know. Oh the, no! The oh, no question. No oh, yeah. question. Yeah. I was going to say you on the radar. radical. <laughs> that's they radical some pictures. as you are. No, you're radical, honey. You're you're literally out here. You're speaking it. You're speaking your truth, and you're speaking it with no f's here. given. Um, exactly. And you know, and then you're in a space. It's it's it's, it's the audacity of you, right? <laughs> to be in a space that is predominantly white <laughs> and taking the white folks' money. Be teaching people, kids. Um, listen, this is what it's about. Listen, this is capitalism. This is racism. This mm-hmm. is white supremacy. This is what needs to be done. This is history, and this is mm. the truth. The audacity of you, and yeah. the audacity of you to get suspended. Still pull back up like, no, I'm an educator. This is what I'm about to do. Right. Y'all not going to take this from me. And, um, <laughs> and, and, and right. I absolutely, um, I absolutely look at you. You got tenure, brother? <laughs> listen, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yes. You need that, yes. honey. Yes, I got you tenure know. early because thankfully I'm good at what I do. Uh, oh, so good. Again, <laughs> yeah, no, good. Cause, but, 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 but it shows that when you are, when you are um, passionate about something, when you're driven yeah. about it, no one can take it from you, period. No matter yeah. what they're telling you that's wrong, that, you know, you you still know that this is my duty. This is my purpose. It has to be done. And I'm willing to take anything that comes my way and keep mm. it pushing, you know, and yeah. that that's real because not everybody can keep step can mm. stay in that moment. Like a lot of people give up because it gets so frustrating. This fight gets hard. I mean, it's yeah. a lot, but um, to see people who are willing to just go through Throw it, it take, on the line. Take, Take all the bullets. No, I, and, um, no, I, yeah. I love I love that you shared that because I think it's such an important component and aspect of movement, right, uh, of being an activist or an organizer, however you define yourself, because I think we always, all of us, will get to that point where we have to make a decision. Do we continue on our path, which is less popular, which would you know lead to possibly loss of friendships, ostracization, I mispronounced that word, uh, being considered, you know, the audacity of me, uh, which I've heard <laughs> many times. Or do we diverge and start to become popular, right? Start to collect the money. Yeah. Uh, you know, nothing's wrong with getting paid because we all need to get paid for our skill set. But I think That's you all it. know what I mean in a sense. We yeah. all get to that that role where we have to pick a, pick a lane in the sense of do we continue to be dangerous uh, or do we become less dangerous in a sense and more popular? And for me, it's just. I mean, at the end of the day, money is cool, you know, but yeah. what is what is money? You know, like I have to be able to speak my truth or I won't be able to live with myself. And, you know, yeah. the kids that I see that I'm impacting, you know, not on my own because this is a collective movement. But when they come to me and they have their own ideas or they're sharing out, we were talking about Cesar Chavez yesterday uh, mm. because we like to broaden, you know, organizing and so on and so forth. And when they come to me and discuss uh, collective bargaining. Like I had a student and I'm a special education teacher. So already I'm sure you know that disproportionately my students are black and brown because they're right. pushed within wow. into the special education system, That's oftentimes it. without a disability, but simply because <laughs> predominantly white teachers as black males were only 2% of the teaching population and black women are far less than whites as well. 
they don't know how to work with our students and they look at them as aggressive. They look at them as, you know, problem mm. problems in the classroom when honestly they're bored. And I would be bored, too, if these white textbooks didn't present me with true factual history that celebrated my people. So, I mean, it's a huge Brandy. issue that exists. And, you know, I don't know. Again, mm. at the end of the day, we'll see where I end up and uh, we'll go yeah. from there. We got a we got a couple of minutes here, um, and and actually, um, but I I want to actually go down that road particularly because um, one thing that I noticed in the school system, and I didn't last. Kudos to you for sticking it out through the school system itself, because just going through that process of coming from the bottom where they don't pay you anything and just sticking out all of the red tape that is associated with being a teacher. To me, it was never commensurate with my labor. I had to get the hell out of there. (laughs) That said, um, you what are your thoughts about the way special treatment is given and rightfully so to um, to groups who need the special attention. I, I, I forgot the exact uh, definition of it, uh, designation mm-hmm. of it. Um, but mm-hmm. when I was a teacher, I noticed one of the biggest challenges for my students that was never included in the IEPs and never included in those type of evaluations. The biggest challenge was poverty. And to me, mm-hmm. it's like special accommodations if any accommodation is going to be given to anybody in this school system, it most certainly should be to my students who did not have places to live. Students who did not have uh, clean clothes because they didn't have running water and they didn't have a washing machine and dryer. What, what has been your experience? Because you've, you've, you've toughed it out in that space for a while. And what are your thoughts on right. uh, special accommodations for poverty? Yeah, I mean, again, when we talk about equity issues, equity is not Uh, If we have a pizza, equity is not everybody getting the same exact slice. There are going to be individuals that need more than one slice, and there are going to be individuals that need larger slices than others based upon the interconnected systemic issues that exist. And I think for me, the biggest issue that I've encountered is the lack of understanding and empathy and the bias that exists within our educational system to where it's a business. Let's be honest. School systems are a business, and they're in the business of just, again, pushing education Mm. and, and making money from it. So when you have students that don't come to school, you have teachers that don't have that perspective or understanding that it may just simply be beyond that student doesn't want to learn because the majority Mm -hmm. of our students, all of our students truly want to learn, but they need Mm -hmm. someone that's willing to teach them that understands their truth. So I understand a student may not wanting to come to school because their, their clothes are dirty. I understand Mm -hmm. a student that maybe not wanting to come to school because they had nowhere to sleep last night. So they were on the street on the block and they're tired or they have younger siblings they have to take care of or they're here. I mean, look at my line and my line is not perfect right now, but they're (laughs) here, you know, because it plays a role in society. So we have teachers that lack that understanding. And it's even so nuanced in the sense to where how and I don't want to overgeneralize, but how black folk communicate, you know, like I'm handsy. Right. We're we're verbal. Uh, We like to move around a little bit. We like MCs. Right. We in a booth. We freestyle when we communicate. And for me, it's just normal communication. But I've right. literally seen students pushed into special ed or pushed into our, our uh, disciplinary processes based upon how they communicate, because there's a white teacher that feels this student is too aggressive or they don't understand mm. uh, that modality uh, uh, of communication. So disproportionately, I'm in a, a school system that is 60, like 63 percent white, uh, about 18 percent black. But. I get, I'm sure you could guess who disproportionately is fed into our disciplinary systems, who disproportionately yeah. receives suspensions. And I also want to shout out Royal. Uh, they're a, a black and brown led student organization who mobilized. I've worked with them in the past. They were able to get SRO school resource officers out of our school building. Uh, so mm-hmm. I truly want to salute them and give them a shout out because adults have failed our youth. Our youth are now leading. They're not future leaders. They're current leaders. And we Mm. have to sometimes take a back seat and listen to them. So it's about empowering students that are looked at and viewed as you're going to be nothing more than an athlete, a a thug or or a rapper. You know, these are leaders. These could be future politicians. These are current leaders. So that's that dynamic that exists. And, And overall, you know, that's just what I wanted to say. Because we lack diversity within our teaching force, we lack teachers that understand different truths that I've never necessarily struggled, that I've never had overdraft fees, uh, that yeah. don't 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 know what it means to have your mama, or your cousin or your auntie, eight people living in a crib together. So we got to speak that, you know, we got to talk yeah. that truth. And when I do that, my students are able to connect with me and they see representation of themselves that, damn, excuse my language. But if he yeah. can make it, you know, in a sense, there there's nothing I can't do, you know, and I think yeah. that's important. Brother Anthony Clark, speaking truth to power, fearlessly speaking truth to power. Brother, you're welcome back anytime you have time.
Thanks so much for joining. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you all for both all that you do. And I'll be back.